Hey guys, welcome back. Happy New Year, 2022. It's got to be better than 2020 and 2021. Anyway, Miss Mary here. And I know you guys have been waiting a while for some new videos and I have a bunch of them coming. This is part one of maternal newborn. Um, remember, subscribe, like, don't forget to click those buttons. And we're going to cover maternal newborn. This is part one. Okay, is everybody ready to learn some stuff today and have some fun? All right, let's do this. And for those of you on my mailing list, I will be sending out copies of this PowerPoint. So make sure if I don't have your name on my mailing list, get your name on my mailing list, get me on Miss Mary RN on my Facebook page, or get me here on the YouTube channel. All right. All right. This part covers reproduction, conception, and pregnancy. All right, so let us begin. Reproduction, when mommy and daddy love each other very much. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, so this is the male reproductive system and the female reproductive system. And just to go over some basic anatomy for the male reproductive system, if you look at the picture here, <clears throat> we've got the scrotum and inside the scrotum are the testes. Those are the male gonads or sex organs. And we've got the prostate gland. No, it's not in the man's butt, contrary to a lot of public opinion. The prostate gland actually sits under the bladder, the urinary bladder. Um, and the urethra comes from the urinary bladder and runs over or kind of like right across the prostate gland and then goes down the penis. So when men get older and they get a swollen prostate, they have a hard time urinating, but anyway. The female reproductive system, we have the VJJ. At the top of the VJJ is the cervix. The cervix is the mouth of the uterus. There's your uterus. The top of the uterus is called the fundus. So the fundus is the uterus. It's just the top part of the uterus. And then you have two ovaries, which are the female gonads, and then two fallopian tubes. Every month after puberty, each ovary, alternating months will release one egg, okay? That happens to all of us. We are born with a finite number of eggs. Men, they can make sperm with an ax lodged in their skull. No, I'm kidding. They, they can make sperm basically until the day they die. Women, we only have so many eggs that we're born with and they mature once we hit puberty. So that's how that happens. Well, here's what happens when mommy and daddy do love each other very much and the sperm enter the vagina, go up the cervix through the uterus and they start traveling through the fallopian tube. The egg was released, hopefully. And as the egg is traveling this way through the fallopian tube, the egg and the sperm meet, boom, one lucky sperm. And that becomes what they call a zygote. And now you have the beginning of a baby. So once that conception occurs, that little blob of cells is going to then travel back through the fallopian tube into the uterus, and it should implant itself into the top one third of the uterine wall, okay? Any lower than that, and then we're gonna have a problem that's called placenta previa, but we'll talk about that later on, okay? So during fertilization, male sperm are either an X or a Y chromosome. Female eggs, also known as ovums, are an X chromosome. So when fertilization occurs, it's either an XY boy or an XX, a girl, okay? Um, we already talked about where fertilization occurs. Once it happens, there should be a total of 46 chromosomes, okay? 23 from mommy, 23 from daddy. The 23rd set is the sex chromosome level. So that's where it's either an XY or an XX. The other 22 sets specifically plot out your genetics. That's, that's how, that's the, the, the blueprint, if you will, for how you are made, okay? And that's important to remember because if something goes wrong and there winds up being an extra chromosome, a third chromosome at one of those 22 levels, a lot of bad stuff can happen. For example, at the 22nd or the 21st level, if you have an extra chromosome that's trisomy 21, it's Down syndrome, okay? So 
Now, pregnancy, you're pregnant. Yay. What are the positive signs of pregnancy? Positive signs means that we're sure, we're sure you're pregnant. So that would be ultrasound evidence. So we do an ultrasound and we can see the fetus, fetal heart tones and fetal movement felt by the examiner. But that usually doesn't happen until about four months. Quickening, which is the mom feeling the baby move, that's a probable sign of pregnancy. And that happens around 16 to 19 weeks of gestation. More probable, probable signs of pregnancy means you're probably pregnant, but I can't guarantee it 100%. And these you need to know for the boards, the Goodell sign, that's a softening of the cervix. The Chadwick sign, that's a purpley red increased coloration of the cervix because of increased circulation, blood flow. Abdominal enlargement, the baby bump. Braxton Hicks contractions. These are practice contractions that mom will feel, just these little twinges of the uterus contracting, getting ready for that big day. Belotment. <clears throat> which is the fetal outline. Abdominal striae, stretch marks. That's something no mom likes hearing. They can be silvery or even purple in color. They usually fade over time. For some people, they don't go away. So moisturize, moisturize, moisturize. And then a positive urine pregnancy test. So those dipstick tests are looking for HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, in a high amount in the urine. That's why it's best to use your first morning urine. Um, these tests are way more sensitive now than they were you know, 20, 30 years ago. So they can even pick up on pregnancy before that missed period. Um, but the way HCG works with a normal viable pregnancy, the numbers of that hormone double, triple, and quadruple the first couple of weeks. No wonder you're moody. That explains it. All right. Something else that you need to know is how to estimate the date of delivery. And that's called using Nagel's rule. And what you do is you count back three months from the first day of the last menstrual period and add seven days. So back three months, add seven days. Back three months, add seven days. And then during pregnancy, you're going to gain some weight. Average 25 to 30 pounds. And it doesn't matter even if mom is a diabetic when she becomes pregnant. She still needs to gain about 25 to 30 pounds because the baby needs that nutrition, okay? So from the eighth week of gestation through delivery, the developing cells are known as the fetus. At about 12 weeks gestation, the fundus, the top of the uterus, should be right at the top of the symphysis pubis. And that's like right where the pubic hair starts. At 20 weeks gestation, the fundus is now at the level of the umbilicus. And at 36 weeks, the fundus is at the lower order of the rib cage which is why the last part of the pregnancy, you're like, oh, can't breathe, the baby's up here choking. A baby is considered full term, anywhere from 38 to 42 weeks. A premature neonate is a baby that's born before the 37th week of gestation. Now, when we talk about gravita, that's the number of pregnancies a woman's had, regardless of the outcome. So even if it was a stillborn, right? It's, it's the number of, how many times have you been pregnant? That's your gravity. Para is the number of pregnancies that reached viability, regardless of whether the baby was alive or stillborn, okay? So in other words, if you've been pregnant three times, but you had two babies beyond 20 weeks, then you would be gravita three, para two, okay? And a fetus is considered viable, believe it or not, at 20 weeks gestation and more. Although a 20 week old fetus, um, it's, it's, it, the odds are not in its favor to survive. It, they can survive, but it doesn't look good. Complications, things can go wrong. So during the last trimester of pregnancy, painless vaginal bleeding, that can indicate a placenta previa. So that's when, remember we talked about where that little glob of cells needs to implant in the top third of the uterus? If it doesn't, if it implants lower than that, the placenta will start to form on the lower portion of the uterus, even over the cervix. Well, that's bad because as the baby gets bigger, the fetus is growing, it's actually putting pressure on its own food and oxygen supply, the placenta. So they're gonna have a scheduled C-section. Now, painful vaginal bleeding, that is usually an abruptio placenta. So, and the word abruptio should trigger you. 
it's when the placenta abruptly tears away from the wall of the uterus. It can either be partial or it can be complete. Either way, this is a downright emergency. Like that's an emergency C-section. That baby does not have oxygen or food, nothing. Once that, once that placenta has torn away from the um, uterine wall, okay? So that's placenta previa and abruptio placenta. Here's some pictures to help you better understand it. See, in the first picture, little happy fetus and the placenta is up here where it should be. Here is an abruption where you see the blood that's in here where my cursor is. Well, that's where part of the placenta is torn away from the uterine wall. Okay. And if it's torn away from the uterine wall, doesn't connect with the uterine wall, it can't absorb nutrients and that kind of thing. So the baby's in, it, baby is in distress. Here is a placenta previa. This is a complete placenta previa where the placenta is literally covering the cervix, which is right there. And so just by sheer virtue of the baby's weight, it's pushing on its own air and food supply. So if mom's gonna be on bed rest more than likely um, towards the end of the pregnancy and there's gonna be a scheduled cesarean section. Other stuff that can go wrong, pregnancy induced hypertension, preeclampsia and eclampsia. So preeclampsia, that's a new onset of hypertension, high blood pressure with protein urea. In other words, urine that has protein spilled into it after 20 weeks of gestation in a previously non-hypertensive woman. So you never had high blood pressure before, now all of a sudden, boom, you have high blood pressure. And so to diagnose it, the criteria would be systolic blood pressure higher than 140 or diastolic blood pressure higher than 90. And they have to have plus three protein in their urine. Okay, that's like eh, 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 preeclampsia, okay? What do we do about it? Well, preeclampsia can lead to eclampsia, which is seizures. It, it can cause fetal death and even harm or death to the mom. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, we're gonna make sure mom is in a lateral position. Left lateral is best because when you're lying on your left side, it takes pressure off the descending vena cava. So it helps with blood pressure. Gonna give her supplemental oxygen in a non-rebreather mask. Um, and make sure she's got padded bed rails in the event that she does seize. We are going to treat the blood pressure with drugs like hydralazine or labetalol, um, nicardipine or nifedipine. The most common one is labetalol, which is a beta blocker, uh, and that will treat the hypertension. Now, the seizures or preterm labor that goes along with those seizures is treated with magnesium sulfate. Okay, it's an electrolyte. So mom's going to get mag sulfate IV. What is the expected outcome? If we're giving you mag sulfate to prevent or stop seizures and to prevent preterm labor, then it's effective if you don't have seizures and you're not having contractions. And then we're gonna be constantly assessing mom to make sure that her deep tendon reflexes are intact and nice and brisk. Because if her reflexes become sluggish or absent, that means that she's had too much mag and the antidote, calcium glutamate, okay? So here are the meds that you've got to know for maternal newborns. This is for maternity. So magnesium sulfate, that's an electrolyte. We use it to control seizures with, pre with eclampsia. Always assess the deep tendon reflexes. If they're sluggish or absent, stop. Give the antidote, which is, you got it, calcium gluconate. Pitocin, oxytocin. This is a tocolytic drug. It's used to stimulate uterine contractions, like to induce labor. So for somebody who's like 41 weeks and maybe they're getting some mild contractions, but the contractions are not effacing or thinning the cervix or, or dilating the cervix because the cervix has to be 100% effaced, which is thin and 10 centimeters dilated in order for that baby to come out. So Pitocin will stimulate the contractions and is used to induce labor. Um, but the side effects that you should know about, and SE, by the way, stands for side effects. Headache, nausea, vomiting, that's the NV, water intoxication, believe it or not, which is kind of like fluid retention, but not exactly. This is absolutely contraindicated for induction of labor for women that have hypertension. It can be deadly. Methylgonervine. Now that's a tocolytic drug too, but that is never given to induce labor. This stimulates uterine contractions if you have uterine atony, which means your uterus is bleh, after you give birth 
and you're having a postpartum hemorrhage. Side effect would be hypertension. Misoprostol, which is the second choice for postpartum hemorrhage. Side effects, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Labetalol, beta blocker, and all beta blockers can cause heart failure and bradycardia. And this is used to treat preeclampsia or hypertension. And nifedipine, calcium channel blocker, also used to treat preeclampsia or pregnancy-induced hypertension. Same side effects, bradycardia, heart failure, okay? What does mom need when she's pregnant? All pregnant women need a Tdap, right? What is a Tdap? Everybody remember? Tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, whooping cough, okay? During the last trimester, because you don't want the baby to get whooping cough if you get it. It helps prevent the baby from getting it until it gets vaccinated. Um, all women should have a group B, group beta streptococcus test. They do a vaginal or a rectal swab, usually around 36, 38 weeks. In and of itself, group B strep is a harmless bacterial infection. It's not an STD, right? So you, you don't get it because your partner was cheating on you. It's just one of those things, the bacterial infection that can occur. But if it's not treated and mom has it when she's delivering the baby, the newborn can have horrible and severe health issues, even death. The treatment's simple, penicillin, okay? Rogam, RH. Let's talk about the RH factor for a minute. If mom is RH negative, okay, then we don't know if the baby is RH negative or RH positive. If the baby's RH negative, no biggie. But if the baby is RH positive, during the act of delivery, even whether it's vaginal or cesarean, there's a certain amount of exchange of blood between mom and baby that occurs. So if baby is RH positive and some of that RH positive blood goes back into mom's bloodstream, well, mom's body is gonna go, what is that RH stuff? We don't have that. And mom's body is going to develop antibodies against the RH positive blood. No big deal for that pregnancy. But if mom gets pregnant again, then the antibodies will actually kill or severely harm that next baby, okay? So the Rogam shot needs to be given to an RH negative mom anywhere between 26 and 28 weeks of pregnancy. And then another shot is given within 72 hours if the baby is RH positive. If the baby's negative, no harm, no foul, okay? And there's something else to keep in mind, toxoplasmosis. So this is a parasitic infection that really is the worst in kitty litter, cat feces. When you're pregnant, you should never go near a litter box, period, end of story. Somebody else should be cleaning that litter box, okay? Also, it's found in uncooked or severely undercooked foods. So you don't want toxoplasmosis. It can be fatal to the fetus. Sarah's little picture, so you can see the height of the fundus as the baby grows. The fundus, the top of the uterus is growing and moving up, 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 okay? What are some expected findings in pregnancy? So generally speaking, some women get something called cloasma. They call it the mask of pregnancy. It's this pigmentation of a specific, so that's what circumcised means, specific area of skin, usually the bridge of the nose and the cheeks, and it's like a darkened area. Some pregnant women get it. It usually goes away after the pregnancy. Linea nigra, which is this dark line that extends from the belly button, from the umbilicus down to the mons pubis, appears during pregnancy, goes away all by itself after pregnancy. Leucorrhea, this is a thin, white, or clear vaginal discharge. Usually women will have it throughout the pregnancy. It's normal, it's no big deal. Morning sickness. Morning sickness in and of itself is not a big deal. Some women have it usually only in the first trimester. And it's usually, get, you know, when they, when they wake up in the morning as they're getting out of bed, they feel a little queasy, a little nauseous. So one of the best treatments is to tell them, keep some crackers at the bedside and nibble on a little dry saltine cracker before you get up. That'll usually help settle it. But then you can have something called hyperemesis gravidarum. So what that is, is that's an extreme of morning sickness. It's not an expected finding, but I wanted to put it with morning sickness so you could see the difference. So this is where they can't keep anything down. No food, no liquid. They're at risk for electrolyte imbalances, malnutrition, dehydration, the whole nine yards. This usually requires hospitalization and IV fluids. 
So that's an unexpected and dangerous thing, okay? Some other expected findings. During the first trimester, you're gonna be peeing all the time, frequent urination, fatigue, amenorrhea. Remember, a in front of a word means without. So in other words, no periods, a, and tender breasts. During the second trimester, you'll start feeling these Braxton Hicks or practice contractions. You may start getting some heartburn, acid reflux, because the fetus is starting to press on the stomach, which is pushing the stomach acid up the esophagus. And no, it doesn't mean the baby is going to have a head full of hair, old wives tell. Constipation is not uncommon. Sometimes leg cramps, sometimes a stuffy nose, and then the linea nigra, the cloasma, and the striae we talked about. So usually first trimester, you feel crappy. Second trimester, generally speaking, most women feel pretty good. Third trimester, now you're going to start feeling crappy. Again, start to get possibly lower extremity edema, feet, ankles get swollen, back aches because you're carrying this load in front of you, heartburn will get severe, constipation, sometimes even shortness of breath because that baby's pressing on your lungs and your diaphragm. Hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are varicose veins of the rectum and anus. And when I tell you they hurt, they hurt. Um, urinary frequency comes back again to haunt you and urgency and the leukorrhea, of course. Unexpected findings. If mom's complaining of blurred vision or headaches, ooh, you know, how's her blood pressure? That could be a sign of preeclampsia. If mom is complaining of painful burning or frequent urination, could be a UTI, okay? And pregnancy actually does alter some of the self-cleaning action of the urinary structures. So the bladder doesn't always empty completely. And retained urine gets alkaline and a bladder infection can actually occur. So the symptoms would be, you know, it burns when you urinate, increased frequency and urgency, or you could even start developing a temperature, okay? Vaginal bleeding, with or without pain, remember, ruptio placenta with pain, placenta previa without. And then a new onset of urinary incontinence. Are you incontinent or did your water break? The sac of fluid is called the amniotic membrane. And sometimes people, you know, like on TV, boom, the water breaks and there's this flood. Well, it's not always like that. Sometimes there's a slow leak. So if a woman says, you know, gosh, 36 weeks, 37 weeks pregnant, and I think I'm peeing myself a little, you, the nurse, are going to dipstick that to make sure it is urine. You're going to use a nitrazine strip because that will turn blue if that fluid is actually amniotic fluid and not urine. And by the way, if the amniotic membrane ruptured, the water broke, there's a slow leak, she's at a high risk for infection. And so that's something to be concerned about because, you know, now there's an open route through the vagina up right to that baby, right? So that's something to remember. Unexpected findings. One of the worst things is an ectopic pregnancy. So this happens, the word ectopic means something is somewhere it's not supposed to be. Where the pregnancy Usually, instead of traveling through the tube and going to the uterus like it's supposed to, the egg, once it's fertilized, will somewhere along the line in the tube just stop and start to develop. That is, is not going to be a viable pregnancy. So, And if, if it's not detected right away, the bad news is it can even rupture the tube and the woman can lose the tube. So, you know, something important to know. Um, there can be implantation down low right down here at the Oz, which is the, the bottom of the uterus or at the cervix, which is even lower. And those are not usually viable either. And rare occasion, it can implant itself instead of going through the tube, it floats away over here and floats up into the mesentery by the intestines. Also not a viable pregnancy. Diagnostic procedures, what, what do women need to have done? Well, ultrasound is one of the most common, right? So there are two types of ultrasound. There's external ultrasound, which we see right in this picture here. It uses sound waves with a Doppler to actually take pictures, look at the fetus, you can see the heart beating and all that cool stuff. Transvaginal ultrasound uses an internal transponder that goes into the vagina and it gives a more specific image of the fetus and the placenta. Keep in mind as the nurse, if mom's having an ultrasound, she should have a full bladder. If mom's having a transvaginal ultrasound, she should have an empty bladder, okay? Okay, 
So another test that's done during pregnancy is the non-stress test. And so we want to see what the baby's heart rate is doing when it's not stressed, right? And we also want to make sure that the baby's moving, right? So we attach a fetal heart rate monitor to the baby and a uterine contraction monitor to mom. And then we give mom this little button, this little clicky thing. And while she's sitting there, she needs to click that button every time she feels the baby move. Normally, when the baby moves, its heart rate should go up a little bit, about 15 beats a minute, and it should stay elevated for about 15 seconds. This non-stress test is usually done for about 10 to 20 minutes. If there are two accelerations of the fetal heart rate that lasts 15 seconds after the movement, then that's a reactive test. In other words, the baby's good, everything's good. That's the desired result. If there's no fetal acceleration or there's no fetal movement, then more testing needs to be done to make sure that the fetus is okay, right? Amniocentesis. So this is an invasive diagnostic procedure. It's done to diagnose um, specific congenital and chromosomal defects like Down syndrome, spina bifida, those kinds of things. Woman's supine. There's a wedge under her right hip to displace the uterus off the descending vena cava. Um, she should have an empty bladder and under guidance of ultrasound, doctor is, or nurse practitioner or midwife is going to put a needle through the skin right around the umbilicus and into the amniotic sac and aspirate just about 15 mils of amniotic fluid and send it off to the lab for testing. It's usually done during the 14th to 16 week of pregnancy. Now, mind you, it's invasive, so there can be complications. I mean, and even fetal death because now you introduce a foreign object into the amniotic sac. Um, so this is done when, you know, again, risk versus benefit. Are we really concerned that this baby has a congenital defect? So then we really, the risk of the test is less than what the benefit would be, right? Does that make sense? And that's the end of part one. And that's what I dropped the mic. Boom. Questions, you know how to reach me. Hit me up on the YouTube channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Part two is coming up next. Bye.